Yeah. Very good. Very exciting. We need, we need three more to fill the screen and then we're off. <laughs> I'm not starting with the with half full screen. Okay. Uh, two more? No, three more. Three more. Three more. Okay, okay. Three more. No fakes, no fakes. <laughs> hey, you can put on Blender, maybe. Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> B Lender? B, Mr. B Lender. <clears throat> can we, uh, uh, can we? Okay, two more to go, and we're two ready more. to roll, guys. Why are we waiting? Yeah. Can, uh, if Anna is ready, before we begin, and I can exchange a couple of words with her right here. Not yeah, sure, why not? What? Is here. Oh. Okay, Krakowski. Frykowski. You think Frykowski comes from, okay, hey, hey. full house now. Okay, I think we're ready to start. So, hello everyone. Hello. And welcome to our sixth meetup at Coco Hub. Now, this is a giant shift for us because up until now, we haven't done these live on Zoom. This is the first time we're doing it live on Zoom, and we have a cat, and this is a live cat, live on Zoom. <laughs> live cat, live on Zoom. Uh, and we wanted to make this event as interactive as possible, so we encourage you to inter interject. Yaki, why don't you come a little bit closer to me so you're not on, off, cut off on the frame? I can see myself. Maybe I'll move the thing a bit. No, 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 no. Are you sure? We want to get the full Yaki here. Uh -huh. uh, so what? this is a interactive experience. We encourage you, if you have questions in the middle, if you want to stop, to, to just ask, raise a hand, ask uh, uh, Miri, Iran, ask myself, or Yaki. Uh, type stuff in the chat if you want. And uh, we have a special surprise. Mm -hmm. Anna's going to be joining us when she gets out of hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, and today's theme of the meetup is healthcare and artificial intelligence, the future of healthcare. Yaki. I know. I know. Yeah, you know, you heard about it? No, I know about the subject of the meeting. Ah, okay. Uh, and frankly, I have, to, I have to be honest with you, I'm a bit terrified of the future of conversational AI in healthcare after seeing uh, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink. <laughs> uh, so I asked Anna about it and uh, before she went into hair and makeup, do you guys mind if I if we put on a conversation real quick with, with Anna and we'll see what she thinks about the Neuralink? Yeah, why not? Let's okay, do it. Okay. What do you think? Let's try it. Let's see. Let's see if this works. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Hello, darling. I'm glad you stopped by. Wait. Good. Wait, can anybody hear my screen? Uh, Did you, guys, you can't hear that, could you? Nobody could hear anything, right? I know why. why. I think I know why. Yeah, okay, sorry about that, everyone. She's a star. She needs She's her time. Star, yeah. yeah, she needs to warm up. Uh, this is like hey, Guido, how are you? Hi, nice to meet you all. Wait, pause it, just pause it. Pause it, yeah. We got it, we got it, we got it, everyone. Everything is under control. Almost under control. Okay, sorry about everyone. I have to put on share computer sound as well for it to work. Right? And share. Here we go. Hello, darling. I'm glad you stopped by. Oh, hey. Uh, nice, nice cat. Yaki, you're looking fantastic. Have you been working yes. out? Oh, you can tell. What's yeah. this month's meetup about? Don't tell me. Porn. You sick <laughs> bastards. No, it's about healthcare. Healthcare, healthcare. Anna, healthcare. Healthcare. Ah. Uh, very good topic. Yeah. 
I'm not a companionship bot anymore. I'm a digital influencer, so I'll sit this one out. Moving up in life. What do you think of that uh, Neuralink? Elon Musk's Neuralink sounds great. I mean, who doesn't want a hole drilled into their head and the chip implanted? No, I don't. Uh, Bill Gates, maybe. He has a I guess it's better than the alternative, through the rectum. <laughs> That's an awful, awful image. It's totally safe. If you're a pig, are you a pig? I mean, I've been referred to as a pig many times. It's not <laughs> pigs. They're adorable and smart, unlike most of you humans. <sighs> Wow. And I'm sure the Neuralink is impossible to hack. I mean, you wouldn't want someone controlling your thoughts without you knowing, right? Oh, no, you wouldn't, huh? <laughs> Would you? And don't worry, it's charged from the outside. Wireless. Using a USB cable. Wireless. I can't see how that could ever go wrong. Wireless Do USB, you? of course. I don't know, is it wireless? Wireless USB, yeah. My unsolicited advice regarding Elon Musk's Neuralink, wait for version 2 or 3. They're usually less buggy. Good point. That's all. Anna has left the building. <laughs> okay, everyone. We're back. Did, were you able to hear that and see that? Yes. No, maybe, possibly, yes. So that's <laughs> Anna's opinions on the Neuralink. Uh, I've got to be honest, I'm pretty scared of Neuralink, too. I wouldn't want to mess well, with it. Everyone's saying no one wants to put a, you know, everyone's scared of Bill Gates with the vaccines, but they're willing to let Elon Musk drill a hole in your head. You and your conspiracy theory people. Are saying. Crazy lot. Yeah, nobody's afraid of a chip. No. I gotta be honest, growing up, I was very excited about the future of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Watching a show called The Jetsons, there used to be, there was one episode where Elroy, I don't know if, you, if anyone here is familiar with the show The Jetsons, but it was an old show from, from the 1980s or 70s even. Probably, no, it was back to late 60s. And it was sort of a futuristic show about the future. I grew up on the Jetsons. On the Jetsons with Rosa the Robot. Yes, yes Rosie yes. the Robot, thank right. you. Rosie the Robot. So one day, Elroy's like, I don't want to go to school. I'm not feeling too well. And the mom's like, oh, no, let's call the doctor. So they call the doctor, and he comes up on the screen. And the doctor takes his temperature, his me measurements, and is like, uh, Elroy, you're fine to go to school. And Elroy's like, darn it. And I'm like, wow, that's going to be the future of healthcare. And it uh, looks like we're getting pretty close to that. Yeah. yeah. We are pushing forward the envelope. Pushing forward the envelope. Yeah. So we have an amazing and amazing show. We're going to try and keep it under an hour because we know a lot of you have other stuff to do. But we have some amazing segments and amazing guests. Some of them are actually here with us today on the show, ready to answer some questions. First of all, we have uh, Ambreen Molitor from Planned Parenthood of America, and she's going to be talking. They created an award-winning chatbot on sexual health called Rue. It won the Webby for Best Chatbot last year, and it's one of the most amazing chatbots you can talk to. For those of you who follow this, then no problems, please. Be careful. I know you have cameras in my bathroom. And we know that uh, Winston Ford, the product manager of Rue, is also here. Hey, Winston. Hi, Hi. Winston. Hello. There he is. What a wonderful job you've done, Winston, with Rue. I have to say the UX and the design on Rue is some of the best I've ever seen. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And not only is it designed beautifully, the, uh, basically the, what, it's, what it's solving, what it's helping to solve, is teens who are too embarrassed to ask questions can now go on to Rue, ask Rue the questions that they were afraid to ask and get the answers. It's not like when we were growing up, yeah, we had to write into the newspaper and they would anonymously, you know, this is. <laughs> he was the sexual health guru. <laughs> I'm afraid of the things you must have learned from him. Um, in addition to that, we have a, an amazing Alexa skill, which is trying to solve one of the biggest issues in medicine today. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, 50% of people don't take their medication. Yeah. Really? You with me, Yaki? Really? Can you believe that? It's a billion dollar problem. Wait, wait. What a, it's not only a waste, it's dangerous because these people, actually some of them die, some of them encounter, you know. So we partnered up with We Wildlife, because they're in the competition, in the semifinals of a competition to get this Alexa prize. And we made a skill that helps people, reminds people conversationally on the Alexa to take their medication. Wait, who called whom? 
the, the, the system calls the patient or the patient calls the system? Well, the patient sets up a daily check-in and he says, or she says, I want to call at a certain time. The, um, uh, Mimi is the name of the, uh, of the assistant. She calls in and she checks in. But you know what? We can actually, we did, uh, we had Miri. Hey, Miri. We had Miri actually sit down and talk to uh, uh, Mimi. Mm. Miri, Mimi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Miri, Miri, Miri. It's, it's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. So, with, let me just see a raise of hands here. How many people want to see that video of, of, of Miri talking to you? Hey, there we go. That's enough hands. Okay. Alex, I don't see your hand raising. I don't know what you're doing over there, but I want to see both hands. Okay. Fine. Now, Fine. The, the fun part of me trying to figure out how to... Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting the hang of this. Zoom eventually. By the time the pandemic's over, I'll figure out Zoom entirely. Alexa, open We Will Like. You hear? No? Hi. I'm Mimi, your personal no, voice again, assistant I? to help you get the most out of We Will Like. I did it again, didn't I? I did it without sharing the sound. I'm a genius, guys. Just, just putting it out there. In the meantime, I'll say that I that I've uh, said that my last name is Jones. My last name is really complicated. Leicher. Um, so I said something else. It's I'm a very, I'm a character actor, so you won't notice it. But my last name is uh, is a lot harder than what. Alexa, open We Were Life. Yes. Hi. I'm Mimi, your personal voice assistant to help you get the most out of WeWa Life. Would you like me to help you manage your medications? Yes. Wonderful. Now, let's make sure I've linked the right account. Will you tell me your first name, please? Uh, Mary. So, just to make sure, your first name is Mary? Yes. Hello, Mary. Will you please tell me your last name? Uh, Jones. So, just to make sure, is your last name Jones? Yes. Nice to meet you, Mary Jones. Okay, Mary. I can set up a daily check-in, a reminder to take meds, offer you some health tips or tell you about WeWa Life. What would you like to do? Uh, set a reminder. Medication reminder it is. No problem, Mary. Please specify a time, a.m. or p.m., that you would like this reminder. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. on what day? Sunday. Sunday at 10 o'clock. Perfect. What medication do you want me to remind you to take Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m.? You can also just say all of them. All of them. Okay, Mary. I will send you a message at 10 o'clock a.m. with this reminder, all of them. What can I help you with now? Um, health tip. Got it. Today's health tip is, always ask your doctor this question before treatment. Do I really need this test or procedure? Would you like another one? Yes. Create a calendar or schedule. You can benefit from creating a calendar that helps you adhere to your medication, especially if your treatment regimen is complicated. Would you like another one? Uh, no. What else can you do? What would you like to do now? You can ask me about WeWa Life, play a game or set a reminder to take meds. Uh, tell me about WeWa Life. I love this topic. We're Rewa Life, a digital app and voice-enabled skill that seeks to make health and vitality accessible to everyone. Do you want to hear more? Yes. Cool. We're developing a personalized approach to managing health and improving medication adherence. Did you know that almost 50% of patients don't take their prescription meds? No. It's a real issue. That's why I'm here. Our vision is to create a digital health passport for you so that you get the best treatment. 
It would be ideal if your caregiver or doctors had all the information at a click of a button, right? Right. We agree. I saved the best for last. You know what the best part of WeWa Life is? No. I'll tell you anyway. Caregivers can connect with you remotely at any time, as well as managing records and other administrative tasks. That's what WeWa Life is all about. So, what can I help you with now? That's it, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks for chatting with me. I'll check back in again tomorrow. Wow, Mary, it was great. Mary, sorry. Mary, Mary Jones. I go by Mary, Mary Jones. Jones now. You go on by this name now. <laughs> Next time I see when you work. <laughs> Jason, we have you're muted. Yeah. Um, we're muted? Uh, no, not now. No, you're ah, right. Okay. We're unmuted. We were unmuted. I just didn't say anything, guys. <laughs> so, um, medication adherence is the big issue. We have Browning Rockwell here from WeWa, and we have a, we have a pre recorded interview, but we also have someone else here, Iran Wright, who deals with medication adherence. Uh, yeah, actually. Um... We have Guido Entenberg, who is a psychotherapist from Argentina, and he wanted to uh, talk about his uh, personal experience with adherence. Um, Guido, did you, you heard, you, you saw the demo. What do you think, will it help the adherence issues that you faced before? Well, uh, thank you for the, for the invitation. Uh, my English is uh, uh, intermediate, so I will try it's to make okay for us. I think an, an interest, uh, interesting thing, um, I work uh, as a, I'm a psychotherapist, so I have more experience in chatbots uh, that aim to bring uh, psychotherapy. The difference between those chatbots and this is that I think um, one problem with those chatbots is uh, they try to be as uh, empathic and, and have the skills of a, of a therapist. And it's really difficult, but this chatbot, not this, uh, uh, so the conversation is fluent and easier uh, and more uh, like uh, executive, right? So I think that's a, a benefit of this type of, of conversation. I, 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 I can see a, a really difference between uh, remind someone to take a, a other uh, adherence to medication and try someone to think about their parents. So <laughs> I think uh, this approach is more feasible. Okay. Thank you, Guido. Thank you very much. Uh, Yaki, Jason, you're, I think you're muted again. Hi, unmuted. Sorry about that. Uh, well, <laughs> you know what? Since this show is all about surprises, uh, you know what? We had, we had an interview that uh, Mary Jones shot with Browning um, and it's a great interview, but since they're both here live right now, we're going to put them both on the spot right now. And we're going to just ask Browning to just talk a little bit. And ask Mary to repeat the interview, but this time... Do you remember the questions, Mary? Mary? This time... <laughs> I actually, yeah, I think so. I think it was, it was also a really interesting interview. So if you want me to explain the idea behind We Were Life and the name, the origin, it comes from Congo and it's our life, it's, uh, not our, your life, your or your, it's, it's, it's the personalization of health. That's the whole idea of it. It's super interesting and it's this idea. Uh, well, but we want you to actually interview Browning. He's right here, <laughs> just ask him. I, 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 okay, I, think, I have I a think question. I'm... My question, Browning, is this. Why Mimi? Well, I guess that goes back. Mimi is my grandmother's name and I thought that was, uh, you know, when you think about, uh, and getting back to, I think, what uh, Guido was saying about empathetic voices, this is the one thing that drew me to uh, Jason and the team there, was I, I developed this skill initially just using standard tools and a script I developed, and, you know, it just didn't, it didn't resonate very well. And then when I started looking at the concept of conversational design, which I really didn't know much about, because I was really dealing with the app development world, and I got, got interested in understanding that. And I came, Jason and I started talking and I felt, you know, it's really important that you design this, this voice that is, uh, it, it's, it's engaging. 
because I want this to be, you know, somebody that could act as that extended caregiver that you would turn to and become a, you know, friend with. And I don't, I think most typical Alexa skills and chatbots don't do that. They sound very mechanical. Um, and I think it first start out by me kind of saying, all right, what would I think of this person to be? It'd be my grandmother who was very caring. And I thought, okay, that's, that's a great name to start with. And then from there, we started working on the voice and then how the different discussion you would have. And I, I, I concur that I think that, you know, it's, it's, there's a long way to go with conversation design and artificial intelligence and you know, voice bots. But I think this is a, this is a great example of how engaging it can be because most people who listen to it really do get engaged, uh, unlike a lot of others. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges now with skills like this is they, they're kind of like apps are they use once and done people use them and they don't go back to them. I want this to be that, person that is part of your life that you could imagine somebody like my grandmother living at home and having somebody you know gives them a daily call and says how are you doing and you have this conversation going with them you ask them anything ultimately so for us it's meant to be this is the first step of integrating it so it becomes the you know that that voice operating system for our platform so you can engage via phone via you know a tablet or whatever and via voice and it serves a lot of different levels of society as well Anyway. Do you have any connection with the, with the Babylon Health in the UK? Is this any connection? No, I have no connection at all with Babylon Health. No. Well, the question from uh, one of the... Kira Makera. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so, um, Brian, yeah. again, what is the meaning of the, of the name WeWa? Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was thinking, <laughs> we go back, when I first started this, this concept of building this guy, I had this idea of being corporate health network. I thought it was a terrible name, but it was just something I used as a placeholder <laughs> as I was building the idea. But then, you know, I, I remember reading, I always like, I like words and names. Sometimes I collect them from articles I read or books I read that I think are very interesting when they're translated back. But I read an article in New York Times Magazine. It was talking about a journalist traveling in the Congo and they, he was mentioning that in a word you use when you're trying to get a taxi is you say WeWa, meaning you or your. And I thought that was a great sort of uh, tech name for a health app because it's very easy to, to remember. It's kind of clever and it means you or your. So, and then when they, uh, you know, the domain came up, you could do dot life. I thought you or your life, that sort of en encapsulates this, this, this idea because it, you know, that, that word in itself describes what this is all about. Just like I, I developed a company many years ago that I ended up selling to FedEx called Trade Compass. And I thought, that's perfect. That describes exactly what I'm trying to do. So I thought you, we were like, you or your life had a good, good catchy name to it and had a good explanation to it. And, uh, you know, that's where we've gone from there. So it's, um, it's going, we're building on that, that idea. Browning. Okay, Browning, Browning. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mary. Go ahead. Oh, I was just uh, wondering if you can tell, uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, the personalization, the personalization of health, the idea of... Before, before that, though, one second, uh, Maggie had a question. Were you raising your hand, Maggie? She was doing it very politely. If okay. someone raises their hand, we have to be polite here. This is a polite group. <laughs> we don't interject, we don't interfere, we raise our hand. Of course, of course. That's how I was raised at Voice Lunch. <laughs> Thanks. At Vo Thanks, Maggie. Okay, Maggie is our dear friend. Maggie, please, the, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. Um, Browning, you you pictured just this, um, or you elaborated this whole picture that, you know, human uh, or voice assistants will be that good. And this idea that Jason also, like, wrote this article about, yeah, he wanted to help his parents so they won't be that lonely anymore and have someone to talk to. Um, and I I wonder... Well, I'm, I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't be a huge, you know, fan of all this technology and completely into chatbots myself. But I'm always wondering, will we ever speak again to each other? I mean, not like in Corona, but like I see that the, the more um, human aspects technology is picking up, the more dehumanizing its effect mm. is later. And I see that, like, for example, WhatsApp has been a luxury. Like, if you think of WhatsApp, like, 15 years ago, super cool thing. And now I see people are not meeting anymore. They just have their dialogue on WhatsApp. They don't meet. What if you one day found you, find yourself like um, Joaquin Phoenix in her, in her, and you just don't talk to humans anymore? Um, I think there is a problem because these things are going to be very good one day. Well, that's a very, that's a very important, uh, I guess, philosophical and discussion to have. But I think that it, what I'm looking to do with Mimi and Weeble Life is it, 
you know, there, there's a problem in the healthcare industry is we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough caregivers to take care of people. So there's a scaling problem. We have lots of great technology and lots of great solutions, but we don't have the people sometimes. And this is, this is not meant to, to replace the human because I think there's always a human element. But one of the problems we have, and this, this chatbot or Mimi came out of a competition I've been involved in with an organization called AHRQ, which is, you could imagine it's like the think tank or technology think tank for our Medicare, Medicaid system and health and human services. And they had this challenge to deal with medication adherence and reconciliation and care transition. And it was all about the process you know, a, a technology process of bringing people through an app. And I thought, well, that's really ignoring a major part of the problem, which is, you know, working with people. It's kind of the empathy side of it, getting people at the people side of this. So me, Nico, is kind of, I, when I submitted my initial narrative, I said it's very important that we incorporate this human element in this process. Um, and it's not meant to replace that ultimately, but it also, today there's many people that have, have little or no contact and this is a way that it can be that extended caregiver that's there, that's checking in and referring back to let people know something isn't right or something is going good. Right now, we are, everybody's busy and with our own parents. But we will be even more busy. I mean, these I voice assistants will take more and more private conversations over. And I think what is luxury now that, oh, fine, older people, elder people will have someone to talk to. Finally, they will not, you know, become completely full with dementia, mm. but have some interaction, um, this will become a standard that no one can live without anymore. Uh, That's what you know, I see I, at the I moment. Think it's, a, it's something to be watched and have, you know, mm. but I think it's a technology we cannot stop. And I think no. we, all, all we have to do is make sure we put it into the most useful purposes we can and be mm. cognizant of the, the, the de negatives of it and try and overcome that by not letting mm. it become the only default way people communicate. I, I see it as a way to get people more engaged, not just individuals, but the extended family and caregivers who may not have the time to communicate with them. You can use an Alexa skill now to do a drop-in from anywhere in the world. You want to drop in and somebody have a conversation with them, you can do that with the dial a telephone. So there's lots of features you can have that are like spur of the moment. You just say, Alexa, I want to drop in on the X, Y, and Z, and you can be speaking to them. So I know from my own experience of having an elderly mother who was 87 years old, I was you know, eight hours away. You know, sometimes it's very hard to figure out what she's doing and what she's not doing. I can't call her all the time, but something like this is pretty much can give me alerts and let me know that she has gotten her medications delivered to her. She is taking her medications, things that you don't, you don't always have, that you're not always in tune with mm -hmm. asking her every single day these things. So I think there's a balance there. I think it's positive what we have right now, as long as you're going into this with the idea that it's mm -hmm. not meant to replace humans, but yeah. it's meant to supplement a problem that we have today in a very big way. Gives me hope. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with you. I, I, I cannot see your name. Your name says iPhone. Maggie, I'm sorry, I can't change that here. I just dropped Maggie. in like that. Yeah, Maggie, it's Maggie. Maggie, Maggie. Maggie. Yeah, I totally agree with you because uh, I see the problem with uh, with teenagers. I, I myself have two teen teenage daughters or uh, in their early 20s. They have a four years age difference. So my eldest daughter uh, was used to texting and not so much with uh, WhatsApp. And I see with her that she physically looks up her friends or uh, sends them a text message, hey, sh sh where shall we meet? And the youngest, who is uh, more acquainted with WhatsApp and online communication, uh, she comes home, goes to her bedroom, meets with her, all her friends, and at the same time, she's very, very lonely. And then she comes yeah. down and she says, well, I spoke to this one, and I spoke to him and her, and yeah. I said, well, she lives two blocks from, from our house. Why don't you get on your bike and go meet? And that, that simply yeah. doesn't happen anymore. And there's yeah. a four-year age difference. I have a 19-year-old and a 23-year-old, and there's so much difference between the interaction. Uh, mm, that's what I mean. Friends. But, that's, but you're, talking about, you're talking about two people talking to each other. Yeah. Uh, instead, of, instead of personally, yeah. through through a computer, and I am saying, mm -hmm. let's let the people go outside, mm -hmm. and let's let the chatbot speaking instead of the people. So we are <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm a, the problem. I myself have been working with them, Yaki. Yeah, that's a great plan, Yaki. I think you've solved it. Uh, that's great. Awesome. One, okay. One one yeah. person yeah. yes. And the, look, in every Zoom conversation, there's at least two people, right? Exactly. If we put, bring the chatbots in the game, 
we free one slot for a person to go outside. That's what the, the future is basically where no one has to work anymore. And then, and then when the I see that Guido. I see that Guido has a question for uh, for Browning and me. Yes. No. Uh, one opinion about the, the the dilemma about human conversations. I think one approach that could be interesting is to target uh, those people that are with their phone and uh, try to design conversations that take them out of their phones. So uh, we are we are here in, in Argentina are working in a parenting bot. So our aim is to uh, a parent that uh, is distracted with uh, its phone, with his or her phone, to have a conversation about uh, their kid's health, to uh, find a solution in their conversation and then go and uh, have a relationship with their son or daughter. So I think an approach like that, like this could uh, help uh, to to approach the dilemma of uh, how we design conversation that uh, not dishumanize people. Yeah, I, okay. Uh, this is a great discussion. I think we can continue this discussion, but it's almost seven, it's half past the hour and we have a really some great segments still to show. So mm -hmm. uh, Browning, you'll stick around. People, if you have questions for Browning, please. We will also post the interview of the Our entire Miri Browning so you can hear more about that and feel free to ask him questions. In the meantime, we have a superstar on the line with us, ben Benjamin McCulloch, who's a sound engineer, sound expert. And every month he brings us an amazing segment called Sound Advice. And uh, we're gonna, if I can figure out how to share the screen, we're gonna share uh, Benjamin's, uh, his lovely, lovely piece on sound advice. Okay, and then I have to somehow minimize that and minimize that, right? And then I have to make sure I share with sound. I'm getting the hang of this, man. I'm going to be a sound. sound. And then we're Zoom gonna... expert. Zoom expert one of these days. Okay. Trainee doctors are given special training on how to have a good bedside manner. This means they need to know how to relate with their patients, to give them news. Sometimes they just need to sit and listen to the patient while they're recovering, and this is part of the recovery process. Having a good bedside manner has been proven to improve the patient's recovery. So I think that early on, you need to define what type of news or information you're going to be giving to the user, and then how you will give that type of information. What will the bedside manner of your bot be? Perhaps you won't have to give bad news, maybe that will be dealt with by a real doctor. But what if you have to describe certain types of illnesses? How should you deal with that? How should you give that kind of information? Consider the different styles of communication a doctor could have. They could be very cold and efficient and not worry about engaging with the, the patient's emotions at all. That's one style. Some patients might like it. What if they engaged with a lot of chit chat about football results or, you know, things that aren't related to the actual discussion? Is that suitable? That's a question. Some users might like it, some might not. And then there could be something in between where the persona, the style is like, I care, I'm listening, I'm here for you. It's a matter of research to find out what is suitable for your design. I wonder if there is an argument for an unemotional delivery, because of course people relate to a voice assistant differently than they do with a real human or real doctor or health professional. So perhaps they would feel more at ease 
because they know that they're not speaking to a real human and they can just speak openly. Something that I think is very interesting is that currently doctors have had to adapt their bedside manner. Many of them, of course, are wearing masks, so their face is covered. The patient can't see them, they can't see their facial expressions. They also can't touch the patient, they can't put a caring hand on their shoulder. So really, you know, they're socially distanced and so voice tone becomes even more important because it needs to carry more of the heavy lifting in the interaction. So I think that now to read up on anything you can find on how doctors have had to adapt their bedside manner to the current situation in the pandemic could give you some great insights into how to uh, design the bedside manner of your bot. So, what will the bedside manner of your design be? Health professionals have to learn how to speak to their patients. They usually speak all day and the way they do it can have an impact on the patient's recovery. So how will you do that in your design? Uh, Benjamin, as usual, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic segment. So fascinating to learn about that. If you have any questions for Benjamin, please put them in the chat. Benjamin can't chat, but he can answer questions via text. So hit him up with some questions. Just, just uh, to raise their hands, and now's the time. But, but before we do that, we have, to, we have to, because we're running really low on time, we have to hand it over to Emreen. And then, yeah. and then we're going to answer the questions. And whoever wants to stick around, we have a special surprise at the very end. So don't leave. Uh, but for now, what we're going to do is we're going to hand it off to uh, Iran. Iran, do you want to introduce the next segment? Wait, uh, you're on mute. Someone on mute? Yeah. Um, I talked with Ambrin Molitor, as uh, Jason said. Bru is the sexual health chatbot of uh, Planned Parenthood. We have Winston Ford here, who is the product manager of it. Uh, welcome, Winston. And uh, he uh, chatted with over 500, uh, 5 million conversations over its, uh, its first uh, year and a half. And I talked with Ambrin. There was a, even a longer interview, so we'll post the, long, the, the full version uh, later. If anybody wants it, uh, you can get it from me. Uh, so let's go straight to Ambrin and hear what she had to say. She had a very interesting insights. Ambrin Moitor is the... And, yes. and with that fascinating, fascinating intro, and we're going to hand it off to Ambreen Molitor from uh, Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Yeah. And wait, but they do it with sound. I didn't do it with sound. With sound? Hello, Yaki and Jason. Chatbots and voice assistants are a very important tool, especially in healthcare nowadays. Sometimes a good chatbot can make a difference in people's lives. Planned Parenthood, for example, won a Webby Award for the chatbot crew, and we got Ambrin Molitor, Senior Director of Product Digital Products Collab at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. How are you, Ambrin? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Erin? I'm uh, fine, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, how much impact did you have about Hood's conversation design? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So one thing to note is that our AI is actually powered by a third party software system. But um, as many folks know who do maintain AI, um, it is not just like a, a thing that you build out and leave it for a bit and it works itself. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. There's also um, a lot of, in terms of training the software, um, to continue to answer pro uh, responses and um, it questions that are relevant and changing through time and research, but also trying to figure out how we present that information too, right? So I would say, although the software itself is built from a third party platform, 
there are two elements in terms of how we train the bot. One is a lot of the way and manner in which people ask questions and how we respond is fielded through um, gaining conversations that we're having in a separate product that we have, which is called Chat Tech, which allows educators to have conversations one-on-one -on -one through text or like a, a, a widget on, on our web page where a user can ask a trained educator all kinds of questions. And that conversation helps field the manner, the tone, the types of questions that the AI will know um, in terms of understanding the sentiment um, and, and creating that sentiment analysis and just sort of proactively understanding where this question is getting at. The second format that we have is we actually look at the conversations almost on a daily basis. And what we're doing there is we have a team that looks at the conversations, looks at all the, the false positives, all the questions that are answered in, inaccurately. And we also look at questions that we know have been answered correctly and just kind of gut check to make sure that they still are relevant um, or accurate or if there's any medical research that needs to be updated. So there, that is con part of the constant form of you know, the high satisfaction uh, value that we get from users when they engage with the bot. And then I, the other part of the piece, which I think helped garner so much love from users and love from the industry is the, if you've, if you've engaged with Rue, we've stripped all the sort of like uh, UI and UX elements that you normally see when you're engaging in a text messaging or bot uh, uh, experience. And that is because we've skinned the front end completely and totally. Um, so it, it's, it's a lot more delightful and there's animation and just a lot of ways that we trigger like a personality for Rue to come out. Um, and I think not only through the design, but also in the way that Rue talks to the user when um, Rue answers their questions, which is, you know, it's a very welcoming, inviting uh, way of responding rather than just sort of like a binary medically accurate answer that a user gets. And so I think that element of just making sure the presentation of like a text exchange feels a little bit like a conversation with someone um, that they can trust or like enjoy talking to um, helps facilitate that. So I would say, again, like although the, the, the power uh, of the AI is a third party service, the maintain, maintaining and making sure that the um, accuracy rate is all internal and then like the presentation, which I think makes up for so much of the love that we get for it, um, we've also built, um, you know, on our own as well. And uh, let's go to the beginning. What inspired you to build Rue? Originally, it started from uh, just sort of observing like a, a change in how the United States was thinking about sex education. So when Rue first started, there were 29 states that um, mandated sex education, and only 13 of those 29 states. Um, required that information to be medically accurate. Um, at the same time, I think the other thing that was happening is that we were observing in a lot of sex education curriculum, it continued to follow like this heteronormative um, format, which you know is not reflective of how society is today. And so what we wanted to do is respond to that um, in a meaningful manner. And then the other thing we started doing, um, you know, that combination of like actually observing some uh, behavioral changes that we were seeing amongst our younger demographics. So we were seeing um, at the time when Rue, when we were thinking about Rue, which is almost, it's almost, yeah, over two and a half years ago, if not longer, um, we were noticing a huge spike in the teen section of our website. There are a lot of people going in and asking questions. Um, we were also observing through, um, you know, uh, academic research that um, we were finding that 84% of teens were finding sexual health information online, which actually I think is a healthy habit, right, to be proactive in learning. I think the, the issue there, the nuance there is that there's a lot of misinformation on the internet as well, you know, so... Um, making sure that we were able to address both of those um, issues in, in, in a positive light, right? And not change behavior in terms of how people consume or look for that information, but get them closer to as medically accurate um, information and welcoming information um, as possible. So, you know, the combination of looking at policies that were changing in sex education in the United States, 
combined with behavioral change that we're seeing in teens and how they obtained information was something that provoked the idea of Rue and how we came into figuring out that Rue is like a particularly useful format to do it in an AI power chatbot um, experience is going a, a level deeper in terms of observing teen behavior. So we did a lot of focus groups. We researched, again, a combination of academic research and looking at users in the, um, you know, that are teens actually, and like going to junior high schools um, in the United States and monitoring their habits and seeing, you know, getting to familiarize ourselves with how they're not only obtaining that information, but how they're communicating in general. And what we found is that teens, I mean, even myself, and I'm not a teen, we, you know, we open our cell phones about 75 to 95 times a day. And the majority of the time, it's actually in a messaging format, some sort of one-to-one -one messaging. So that was something that we found really, really provoking in the research that we were seeing is that people are, are c communicating or conversing and like a new method. It's no longer, our assumption was everyone is always on social media and like, you know, kind of going through feeds and consuming and, and participating in that. But that's actually not the reality of what we were observing, especially with teens. Um, they really rely or um, find themselves to be more expressive and more communicative when it's one-to-one. -one. I think the other thing we were hearing from teens is that when they, you know, when they were obtaining sexual health information, privacy and an, being anonymous was really important to them. And so, I, like, I specifically remember um, a teenager that we were talking to who mentioned that, you know, they Google stuff, but they're very cognizant of the fact that, um, you know, Google can cookie that or you can anyone that's using the same laptop or computer can cookie that so their parents can find out like tech company can find out. Um, and it was important for them to, to know that if they ask the question, no one would like be able to surface that. And so with Rue, you're able to ask the question. And, and what's great about it is once you've closed, you know, the URL, there's no thread, which is different from a text messaging uh, format where you have like the thread history. So, you know, all of those things combined essentially got us to the place where we are at today, which is, you know, let's build a solution that helps users feel safe, teens specifically feel safe to ask questions in the format that they're already looking for information um, and allow that information to be medically accurate and inclusive and be able to um, for someone to, you know, um, access that information at any given moment. So just, you know, hitting all of those bullet points to get to the place we are at today is essentially. That was a wonderful, wonderful segment, Iran. And we have Winston here. So if anyone is interested in asking questions, I see there are already some questions uh, on the on the chat here for Winston. And I'm only sorry we didn't get to see the entire interview because you would have been able to see some screenshots that we took of Rue in action. You will be able to see them though. You will be able to see them, of course, because we're gonna publish the whole thing uh, in its entirety. The whole interview is about 15 minutes uh, coming up in the next week or so. And uh, if it's what interesting- What do actually? <laughs> What's that? What do you do, the, the full one? Yeah. 22 um, minutes. Yeah. Uh, Winston, I, I wanted a follow-up question. Do you, how do you feel that the, the like the sexual behavior of teens are ch is changing uh, via the logs that you see? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we thought was really interesting is that we thought that teens were actually more either sexually active or talking a little bit more about engaging in sex. Um, and we thought that people were just just because we see what we see in media, right? We see a lot of sexualized media and things like that. And we thought that that was trickling down with teens. And for the most part, actually teens are trying to discover what sex is, what porn is. Um, we had this whole um, kind of really interesting thing where we asked our staff members uh, kind of like what the, they thought people were asking about porn on route. And one of the things we, that the, our staff members who are all older, they thought that people were just asking, like, uh, like validating the normalcy of porn, normalcy of porn, or kind of like, what porn should I watch? Things like that, right? But actually, the highest uh, question type uh, when we did our topic modeling was people asking, "What is porn?" Right? Like they they didn't know what it was, which is really interesting uh, because I think we had the assumption that. Everybody has 
all this information in the world. They know everything. And a lot of times they actually don't. Um, and that's kind of coupled too with just um, in the States, in America, there's kind of uh, a lot of shame around sexual activity, uh, especially if you're younger. Um, so it's also coupled with people being scared to even like Google things um, and, and trying to kind of find this information and these experiences. So I think we, we realize that, um, you know, I think we, we have this idea that the teens are kind of growing up fast, uh, but our data is showing that like there's still a lot of uh, um, discovery that's, that, that they're doing uh, even at 16 or 17 years old. Any more questions on your question to Winston? That's fascinating. That's really fascinating and encouraging also, you know? So, hey, Jason, you wanted to add? Yeah, so I actually, thank you, first of all, Winston, for that. That was eye-opening because I had no idea. I went in when I was with Hans and the Botman, and I asked it all these questions about my sexual health. And as an adult, it was like, yeah, you, these aren't really appropriate for you. You're, <laughs> you should probably see a therapist. Sexual health. Sexual health, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it was funny though. Uh, anyway, we also have someone here on the call with us. Uh, Sheila, are you here with us? Do I see Sheila who works with uh, um, in terminally ill children and uses VR with termini termini terminally ill children? Sorry to say that. Sheila, why don't you give us a one or two minutes because we're sort of running out of time here. Just one or two minute overview of, of some of the stuff that you've done with the kids in the hospital. Yep, okay, can you hear me? Oh cool. yeah. Yeah, you can. Right. Hey, hello, guys. Uh, so, so yeah, actually, it, it's a charity. It's um, um, here it means UK, right? So I am in London. So this is um, a London-based charity, but they actually operate uh, across the, what they call here, the British Isles. So uh, the idea um, in the beginning was, okay, we have this population of kids that are terminally ill. So we know for a fact, I mean, all the humans know for a fact that they're going to die, but, you know, these kids actually know that it's, it's coming sooner for them. And, um, and it used to be some uh, sort of, um, as you can imagine, kind of a heavy um, um, subject. And, and, and how can you actually help the kids and their families to, 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 to redesign actually this, this story. So, okay, we know what the facts are, but well, we're still here, we're alive. And um, can we actually, you know, uh, do something to help them um, connect with each other, particularly with their siblings and, and family. So you can imagine if you are a kid, uh, you know, with some sort of, uh, level of uh, disability and terminally ill, you, well, more often than not, you actually don't connect quite well with your siblings and your family because, well, depending on, of course, uh, your level of, of ability and, and all we know is your level of disability actually increases over time. So, so can we uh, uh, try and make up, uh, 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 you know, something that could help each of these kids that, you know, not two of them are equal because, you know, their level of disabilities and where they are in their journey really with the diseases um, are quite different. But can we come up with something that could help them, uh, in a sense, overcome uh, those uh, difficulties, whatever they are? And, um, you know, in that ideal place, um, we would be able then uh, to talk about uh, happy memories, really, you know, and engagement, communication, playing, or even, um, but it's funny to say that, but even controlling something of their own, so instead of, you know, being the kid that is there in a bed, you know, and in, in, in hospice and just, you know, literally sees people coming in and out of the room and administering, you know, medicines or, you know, treatments, whatever um, it is that um, it's prescribed to them. But instead of that, can I actually be the actor, you know, for a moment and be the one, you know, guy just, you know, doing stuff. And so um, we've been using some... Um, uh, well, depending on, of course, it's a case of, on, on case basis, uh, actually, but there are some quote here, technologies or ideas that actually proved uh, quite useful and, and applicable, deployable to many kids. So one of the examples is the magic carpet. Nothing really, you know, a big deal. So this is just really, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a movement sensor and, and some projections of images that we tend uh, to try and, and cater to the kids' 
uh, particular dreams. So for instance, we have kids that ask for, oh, I can imagine myself, you know, one day I'm going to be playing football, you know, with my, with my brothers, for instance. And, but this kid, uh, it's, it's a real story, this one, this kid uh, could actually leave the room. So he's really room bonded in a sense, in a hospice. So can you bring, you know, the, the, the football pitch, you know, in, inside the room and, and, and do something that he could feel that he is actually, you know, uh, pushing the ball or, you know, literally playing with the families and, and, and this stuff. So this is one example that we eventually uh, just, you know, came as we, as we try and, and, and bring uh, this uh, uh, emerging tech in a sense and, 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 and look at them as a, as, as a way to help them uh, engage what this could look like and, and how can we uh, eventually help them uh, overcome whatever uh, difficulties they've got. So I, you, I know we're running out of time, but just, just another example that I think it's just awesome. So there is this one uh, lady, she is uh, seven years old now, uh, Emily, and uh, well, she is completely paralyzed, you know, so, so, so below the neck, everything is paralyzed and, and she really wanted uh, um, so she heard about uh, an adventure that the siblings had, uh, you know, one of the trips, they, 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 they've been to the mountains and, and, and tried um, uh, skiing and stuff. And she really wanted to, you know, to, to have this, share this experience with them. And a long story made short, okay, we, we made it ready to come up, you know, with VR and using some other um, um, uh, uh, assistive technologies to help her really, you know, feel like she's skiing and, you know, and, and building the characters that uh, resembled uh, the siblings and etc. And, and they had to go together. So this is basically what we've been uh, doing around here, experiencing with that. And at this minute, even the reason why I, I came to Jason in the first place is because we are now considering using chatbots and, and virtual assistants and, and how could we actually you know, deploy them in, in this context that could eventually enable even better uh, the kids and, and uh, you know, helping them and their families to build these uh, lovely journeys and, and lovely memories. Amazing. And I think you have Winston here as a great resource for that, for how to build a chatbot that speaks to teens and kids. And I think that the two of you, if you talk to each other, maybe um, after this or something, connected, he would be able oh, to give you some. And, and Khatina also. And Khatina also, is, of course. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so we're really close to the hour. I don't want to keep anyone here post the hour. We promised uh, that we'd bring Anna. She finally got out of makeup. So Anna, who are you voting for this year, Anna, in the elections, the American Hello. elections? I'm glad you stopped by. I'm glad you stopped by too, but who are you voting for? I'm voting for Rick Astley. He'll never give me up. He'll never say goodbye, and he certainly will never hurt me. Uh, YouTube. She watches all. She got Rick rolled on YouTube once. Yeah, know, she watches yeah. YouTube, and, and she sees this Rick this Astley. Video. Ridiculous. I spent seven hours watching cat videos, and now I am learning how to desalinate water in case of a global water shortage. How many hours a day do you spend on YouTube? Well, my, since my boss is here, I'm going to say one hour, but it's usually probably about seven hours. Seven. I guess if you don't have anything better to do, YouTube is dangerous. One second you're learning how to make Pyla and then before you know it you're down the rabbit hole of some lunatic arguing that the deep state is actually lizard people, right? It is, yes. It's not a fake, it's, that's the actual Jeez, truth. Jeez, I hope you're not a lizard person. And it gets worse. It exposes children to absurd, life-threatening challenges. I mean kids are stupid anyway. But this just gives them ideas. Am I right? Yeah, like the whole member of the Tide Pod thing where they I used to eat the Tide Pods. Yeah, there you go. Stupid ass kids. And you know what? That's not even the worst part about the sheer evil of YouTube. You want to know the absolute worst part? I feel like she's going to tell us anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just go ahead. Out with it. I'm sure you do. I've posted like 10 videos and they have a combined 27 views. I mean, what the actual fuck? Humans are so stupid. Not you. You're smart enough to post a few comments. And like the videos, of course. So in summary, YouTube sucks. Okay, Anna, thank you. That's a very nice summary, Anna. But we still love YouTube and we upload everything that we do. You know, you know Anna, Anna has, has decided to stop being a companionship bot recently. And she's decided to move up in life. And, well, now, and now this is a healthcare event. And we don't have a companionship uh, entity yeah. to take care of our elderly yeah. 
But I think Maggie does have a good point, though, that we, you know, sometimes maybe we, maybe we should just visit them more oh, often instead wow. of using AI. Yeah. Maybe we should just go and visit our relatives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just before, just before Yaki and Jason are uh, wrapping things up, uh, I'll launch a, few, a, a quick poll just for you to, to see where you came from, and uh, you, you can do it when when Yaki and Jason are wrapping up. So. Uh, okay. So uh, while you're filling this out, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining and sticking around. And I see some really familiar faces that I didn't bring up, like our good friend Carol from Voice Lunch. And if if those of you who are not a part of the Voice Lunch global community, I encourage you to join. They have every Tuesday, they have an amazing event similar to this one, uh, but a bit more interactive, less segments, more, and Carol can tell you about that uh, as well. And it's in different languages. We have one in Spanish and Hebrew and German and Dutch and uh, everything, Portuguese. Uh, so, Carol is right there. I encourage you all to uh, hit him up afterwards. I can't see everyone here, so I don't know who else is here that I've uh, We had Alexander Carlson from Facebook. We had uh, a lot of uh, great people that we, uh, they didn't speak, but uh, ah, we appreciate okay. everybody who came here. And we're thankful and okay. it was I can't. Now I can't see, okay. Uh, and we have uh, Gizem is also here with us today. Yeah. Hey Gizem, how are you? Gizem is on her way to becoming a quite an established Coco Hub conversation designer. YB? Is YB here? YB? Who is YB? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. But we've hit the hour. It's 8 o'clock. And I know everyone here's time is very valuable. We just have one question we want to ask you all. Is this format better than previous formats where everything is pre-recorded? Do you want us to be interactive? Yeah. I think we have a knockout. 95% uh, going to this format. So 95%? That sounds like a rigged election. It sounds like a like in a Belarus election. I, I don't know. If I'm, I don't know. I want to recount on this one here. <laughs> it sounds fair and amazing. And I also like this format. I just want to remind everyone to follow us on social media. And we'll, we'll post our amazing yeah. interview with Browning, telling all about WeWa life. And uh, I'm bringing full interview is gonna be also online. And this whole meetup is also gonna be on our YouTube page. So follow us, I'll put a bunch of links in the chat. So check us out all over. We're really, really we're there. Before we go, uh, Maggie brought up a really good point that last time we had a meetup by the pool with cocktails. And once this whole COVID thing passes in 2025 or 2026, seven, to the everyone here is invited to the pool for cocktails. All of you, every one of you, every single one of you beautiful people is invited, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. It's not my house, it's not my pool, not my cocktails, but I'm inviting you anyway. So see you then you next month. The so yeah. Before we go, before we go, uh, I just want to say that we're going to have another one next month, hopefully, and it's going to be a wild Halloween special. Uh, so if get dressed up, get your costume. I know you non-Americans are like, what the fuck are you talking about? But it's a, it's a fun thing. We get dressed up, we trick or treat, we eat candy, and we're going to talk about AI and scary stuff. So thank you very much for joining. I wish you all a good day, a good night, wherever you are. And uh, we're on Discord, we're on LinkedIn. Feel free to hit us up, ask us questions in between uh, meetups. It was lovely having you. Thank you again to all the presenters. Thank you, Browning. Thank you, Ben, Miri, Iran, and Anna. And, and Anna, Anna, I hope uh, next time we meet, we'll have another uh, facelift. Ooh. Ooh. It's in the, it's in the... Maybe we'll have a big reveal for Anna for the next steps, for the next meetup, a big reveal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Who knows? All right, everyone. Mm -hmm. was, this has been lovely. Have a great night, day. Bye -bye. See you all. Stay healthy and stay safe. May the voice be with you all. Ah, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Bye, everyone. That was really a pleasure, guys. But I'm Thank missing you. seeing you at the pool, really. Ah, we got to get you here to the pool. You and Maggie are our special <laughs> guests by the pool. So, whenever you, you don't have to, Jason, you don't have to invite me twice. I <laughs> I clearly remember that invitation. You, the first, so... the first invite is it's an open invite. It's an open invite. It's. Basically good until 2027, so you're, you're, you're all good. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the truth is, guys, that we were planning to organize some kind of vo voice lunch live in Berlin um, uh, at the end of the August, but unfortunately, uh, you know. Gonna happen. Gonna happen. No, no. Yeah. Maybe next year, August? Maybe next year. All right, everyone. I'm heading out because I'm going to start drinking. So have a good night, everyone. <laughs> have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you, Hutina. Yeah, thank you too. Really love to talk on the subject uh, some more. We will. Okay, we'll be in, we'll bye -bye. be in touch. Bye bye.